golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee. Who Father, that we can come before you this morning, this very morning, and worship with a pure heart, and worship looking to you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Father God, help us to recognize how worthy you are of our worship and to respond. Thank you for this chance to be here with these saints that we just sang. All the saints adore thee. God, that's our goal. That is our purpose for being here this morning. In Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. You can be seated for just a moment. Just want to say a welcome to all of you that are here, uh, both in person as well as those of you that are uh, here watching our service live on Facebook Live. I'm so appreciative of our folks. We've got some, the, the A-team is actually here this morning, back behind the booth. Clint and Melinda, thank y'all so much for filling in this morning. We're going to call them the A-team. I would appreciate them being here. But if you're watching on Facebook Live, thank you so much for watching. I would encourage you to check in, if you can, on your computer or your device that you're watching on. Uh, send some comments during the course of the service just to let us know you're here. And those of you that are actually here, thank you for your presence here this morning. I'm so grateful that we can still gather together in person, in the flesh, and worship the Lord Jesus, aren't you? Uh, amen. There are a lot of places that are not yet back to in-person worship still because of all kinds of things, but we're so glad that you are here this morning. A couple of things you might need to know that would be helpful for you. Next week, next week, we will be doing two things. We'll have a business conference along with our normal worship service, but as part of our worship service, you'll hear a word of testimony uh, from Thomas Kennan, who is our prospective part-time student minister. We are so excited uh, to present Thomas to you. A uh, great, great young man, comes highly, highly recommended from uh, all the people at UMHB and his present pastor, who I know very well, uh, and had some great interviews. Our personnel committee, I mentioned that last week, and we're excited to have Thomas with us next week uh, with a word of testimony and then during the business conference. Uh, for a vote and then next week will also be the vote on the church budget and the uh, new church budget that uh, would have presented last week we've got some additional copies but a little bit different format that will be available at the end of the service in the back foyer at the table I think Miss Barbara is going to be back there but to hand several things out some of those besides the budget we have as I mentioned the last couple of weeks these prayer calendars from our North American Mission Board, which has each day, or each month, four or five days of the week of the month, a different missionary here in the North American Mission Board concept uh, for you to pray for, where they are, what they're doing, and how specifically to pray. But in addition to that, the North American Mission Board also presented to us, and all this material, by the way, uh, we were able to obtain from our North American Mission Board, primarily because of our cooperative program dollars that you give, and all of this was free. Uh, all of the stuff that we're giving you, we didn't, the church didn't pay anything. We paid postage on one of the boxes and that was it. So this is a prayer guide for 
the, the title of the message, which I brought out a couple of weeks ago, Who's Your One? The message will be about that today. Those are back there on that table, too. Please feel free to take those. Kinds of things for you today, along with a North American Mission Board pamphlet that just gives a little information about what is the North American Mission Board. How do our cooperative program dollars go to help missions around our uh, continent of North America? And this is very helpful. If you haven't ever seen one of those, I encourage you to pick one of those up as well. I think there's some bookmarks uh, back there also. So thank you for being here this morning. And uh, I believe most of you got the word on Sunday school due to just an increase in incidences of COVID-19 here, not only in Bell County, but in the community of Holland um, and our declining Sunday school because of COVID in the last several weeks. And many, many are out and still out with quarantines and new positive res results this last week. Uh, we just felt in the, in the health and safety uh, of our folks, of you folks here, that the small group gathering on Sunday morning would be best just to lay low for the month of February. We'll come back the first week of March, uh, hopefully full blast, full steam ahead. Uh, we'll continue to have worship service as normal and Wednesday nights as normal. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna do that, make that little adjustment on Sunday mornings, and obviously still have our online worship service as well. So thank you for being here this morning, and I want to invite you to continue to worship with us as we stand. And let's continue to sing. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. see to see not only him high and lifted up but when was he high and lifted up it made a difference in your life in mine And shame and 
that love, that old cross, for the dearest and best, for a world of our sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Until my trophies at last I lay down Linda Roberts, if she will come up, you folks can be seated. This is our ministry moment, and she's going to share a few things about some ministry that you uh, helped take place this past week. Miss Linda, you come on, and she's going to pray for us at the end of that uh, discussion about her ministry moment or our ministry moment. And during the next song, uh, after her prayer time, that will be your moment. Uh, your way to continue worshiping through the giving of your tithes and offerings again through our baskets our offering baskets here and then at the back of the church miss linda <clears throat> how are y'all today good um brother frank sent me a text this week and asked me if i would share uh, about our backpack ministry well you know that doesn't really require me to do much except Ah, backpacks. Uh, one of my passions, um, 
Miss Jerry got me into this about five years ago, I think. She asked if I would uh, pass out some food for some backpacks and take for the kids. And I said, okay. So uh, that was a long time ago, and we've had lots of changes, but good changes, I think. Um, one of the things we, at first, when it first started, we went to Temple to uh, CPLC and picked up the food, and we took pickup, we took the van, church van, we took uh, a cattle trailer. Uh, we've taken all kinds of things to pick up food for the backpack ministry. Uh, but a couple of years ago, the food kind of got different. Some of it was outdated. Uh, different things changed. So uh, we decided to start ordering food. That kind of became popular. You could order food online. You could go pick it up or you could have it delivered. So that was a change, which was very good for me. We didn't have to go do that anymore. Uh, Barbara now orders the food. So um, this is a community outreach ministry, though. Some people don't realize that, that it is a community organization, not just First Baptist. The church is gracious enough to uh, help we store the food here. We come here to pack the backpacks, but it is a community organization. It takes everybody in the community to put it together, and we are so thankful that we have so many volunteers. We met this past week on Wednesday, and I think we had nine volunteers. It took us about an hour to pack uh, about 100 backpacks. We pack enough to last a month. And uh, I take the backpacks during the week, each week, to the school. The school is very involved. Miss Kim is one of our go-to persons that if those kids don't turn those backpacks in, she is gracious enough in her own time to spend time to send a letter to the parents so that those backpacks would come back so we can fill those backpacks with food. Food that will last two days during the weekend if a child is not, doesn't have very much at home, or this is just a supplement, we try to provide uh, protein things, uh, tuna, uh, beans, uh, soup for a child to be able to open that on the weekend by themselves if they have to, to get a little nourishment. So it takes everybody. So if you, could, would, want to, we would accept any volunteers anytime. Or if you can't volunteer, if you're working, we'll accept your money. We'll just accept anything that you can do. Lots of prayers. Just wanted to say one little thing last year when the <clears throat> coronavirus hit, you know, everything stopped. Backpacks didn't. We were so gracious that the school and some volunteers came. We were still able to pack those backpacks. The school delivered those backpacks to the child, to the family. So those backpacks continued, and we're just thankful for that. So thankful that this ministry has continued and hopefully will continue for years to come because those kids are our future. Those kids are the future of Holland, of this church, of this community. So let us pray, dear Heavenly Father, for this day and for all that you do for us. We are so thankful that this ministry has continued and we hope will continue until you see fit that it shouldn't. We thank you for all you do for us. We know we are such a blessed, blessed community and a blessed church. We thank you for all that you have given us. And we lift your name, dear Heavenly Father, and praise you among everything that we have. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we want this coronavirus to just go away. And we know that you're still in control and that 
You have reason for this. We know that you will see us through. Forgive us when we fail you. Forgive us when we don't have the faith that we should have. All these things I ask in your most holy and precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Chains, world had a hold on me. My heart was a stone, I was covered in shame when he came for me. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his presence. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his arms. Jesus, he loves me, he loves me, he is for me, Jesus, how can it be, he loves me, he is for me, it was a fire deep in my soul. Out of the dark into the light when he called my name, I couldn't run, couldn't run from his presence, I couldn't run, couldn't run from his arms, Jesus, he loves me, he loves me, he is for. can it be he loves me he is for me he holds the stars and he holds my heart with healing hands that bear the scars the rugged cross where he died for me my only hope my He loves me, he loves me, Jesus, how can it be, he loves me, he is for me, he loves me, and he loves you too, Jesus. loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so sing it out the little ones to him belong they are weak he is strong sing it out yes Jesus yes loves me yes Jesus loves where do we get that from the Bible tells me so amen and amen thank you you can be seated important that we continue to do as the Bible tells us so, as the Bible tells us so. And I think this message this morning, straight from the word of the Lord, will give us a little bit of that thought as well. Let's play a little game. Let's play a word association game real quick. I'm going to throw out a word. 
And you think about the first thing that comes to your mind when I throw out this word, food. Okay, some of you are saying, I'm hungry now. Is that what you just said? Don't bring that up right now, Frank. All right, food. What's your food that comes to your mind? Did I hear pizza? There's a, there's a youth person. All right, what else? Some kind of cake? Chocolate cake. Is there any other kind of cake besides chocolate cake? That's the question. All right, food. Anybody else got a good one? Wait, what was it? A banana pudding. Okay, desserts. Do y'all only eat desserts? That's the question. All right, we may, we may have to address that in another message on, you know, I don't know, uh, eating good desserts or something along that line, which I love both of those as well. All right, pet. Pet. Dog. Cat. Who said cat? Oh, man, y'all know. Okay, well, I'm just not even going to go there. Nobody said aardvark. You know, and we've got the, uh, there's got to be some uh, young people that will be at the Ag Center uh, next weekend, I think it is, and I've already heard about pigs and all kinds of other animals, and I didn't hear that just mentioned, and I'm not going to call any names out here that are raising pigs, uh, but there are some of those, okay? So some of you have some pets from time to time that are a little besides dogs and cats. All right, now here's a good one, very applicable, very timely. Super Bowl champion. No, right, well, th th nobody said Cowboys, right? I don't know if you can remember that far back, all right? It's kind of like some timer's disease. It's not, you know, we just kind of, it's back there, but somewhere we just don't remember when that time was, right? But uh, Super Bowl champs. Now, who are you pulling for next week? Chiefs. Chiefs, I hear Chiefs. Yes, yes. I want you to know I played for the Chiefs uh, for one year. I was in eighth grade, and it, we were called the Chiefs. We were, you know, we were called the Chiefs. So anyway, that's, that's my claim to fame. That's the only claim to fame I have in football is I played for the Chiefs and the Dolphins the next year. So uh, those are two good teams. But right before uh, anything happened, I saw the light and knew that was not my future. Mind games, word associations. What about the word Christian? Mm, there's a different one. When I say Christian, do you think about somebody? Or do you think about traits and characteristics? Perhaps you think about traits and characteristics. So a couple of other questions since I threw out one that's a little bit harder. What are we as Christians to be known by according to God's word? If there was one trait, what was it? Love. All right? How will the world know us? By our love. And according to John 3.16, what was Jesus' most outstanding characteristic towards us? Love. And that's a characteristic and trait of what? What are we describing? Christians. You realize at the time when this word was written and the same copy that you have to you, Christian was a derogatory term created by the Romans because they didn't like Jesus. They crucified Jesus. And they called his followers Christians, which in that day, in that context in the ancient Near Eastern world, meant little Christ. And that was not a good thing to be called. Boy, how cool would it be to be known as a little Christ today? We could flip that coin on the other side, right? But if we look at God's word, the word Christian is only used in the New Testament three times. But the followers of Jesus weren't known by the characteristic of being a Christian. No, what they were known as is disciples. You find that in Acts eleven twenty six, the very first time where we see that, that believers in Jesus were called Christians. This is what the scripture said, eleven twenty six of the book of Acts, the disciples 
the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. So who was it that was called Christians? The disciples. Now the word disciples is used in the New Testament 281 times to describe the believers and the followers of Jesus Christ. Christians three times. How much do you hear disciple used today? Look, folks, I'm just, this is out of here. I'm not making this up. So it would be good and applicable and appropriate for us to decide what we would rather be known as in today's world. Would we rather be known as a little Christ, which there's nothing wrong with that. Though the Romans meant it for evil. Or would we rather be known as a disciple? So let's kind of look and see what that actually means. Turn, if you have your copy of God's Word, to the book of Matthew, New Testament, Matthew, very first book of the New Testament, chapter 4. Matthew, chapter 4, beginning at verse 18. If your Bible, if your copy of God's Word has some little titles for different sections, it it may have something like what mine has right here, the title of this little section, Jesus Calls the First Disciples. Okay, and so right here we have this. Verse 18, Matthew 4. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets. Immediately they left their nets. How soon did they leave their nets? Immediately. Let me think about it. Jesus, let me get back with you day after tomorrow. You know, I need to pray about this. There are some things you don't have to pray about. They didn't. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, I mean uh, Zebedee, and John, his brother. Some of these names, you know, they're just kind of a little different in in the word of God, and that is okay. You know, Caesar is what we typically name our dogs now, but that's who people want to name their children in that ancient Near Eastern world was after Caesar. And it's kind of interesting that we uh, flip that coin as well. But James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat was Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them, he meaning Jesus, called them. Verse 22. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Okay, how soon did they leave the boat and their father? Immediately. Now, there's a couple of things I want to bring out about these, just these few verses that we're looking at. Matthew 4, 18 through 22. Jesus is beginning his ministry. He knows he needs some help to do it. He's going to engage people in the ministry. And so he talks about saying to them, follow me and I will make you, make you. That means put things in order right now and in the future in the Greek tense. Right now and in the future to make you become a fisher of men. And that word men is an either gender tense in the Greek New Testament. So it means fishers of men and women. In other words, fishers of people. That's what I'm going to make you, Jesus said to them. And so they followed immediately. Now, why does any of this, or should any of it, make sense to us? Let me give you a little bit of the historical background of why these four men would immediately leave their profession and follow Jesus. Number one, all Hebrew boys, all all. That's three letters. All Hebrew boys went to Torah school, starting at age five. Torah, where they learned the first five books of the law, the books of Moses. At age five, all 
Hebrew boys went to Torah school. At age 10, the young boys already knew the Torah, and the best ones that knew it the best, well, they went on to study the remainder of the Old Testament. And the rest, those that were not the best, returned home. So you got age 5, you send your boys to Torah school. By age 10, those that knew the Torah the best went to study the rest of the Old Testament, and those that didn't know it the best returned home to work in whatever their family business was. At about age 17, if you want to go on and make a career out of religious studies, your next step was to find a rabbi. Now, this is historical content. This is what these, this is what Peter and John and James were having to deal with and Andrew. They were dealing with a history of where they were, who they are, who their parents were, what their work, what their vocation was going to be. And at age 17, if you want to go on and make a career out of it, hmm, then you found a rabbi that you admired and you would go and sit at his feet. That was your saying to that rabbi, hmm, I want to be your Talmudim, the Greek word for disciple. I, I want to sit at your feet, and I want you to take me under your wing, and I want to learn from you. That's at age 17. And if he accepted you, then you would continue to sit at his feet, and you would continue to learn from your rabbi, and the rabbi would examine you with all kinds of questions because he knew what he was wanting. His goal was to create someone that was just like him, that believed just like him, that spoke just like him. That's what he wanted, his Talmudim, his little disciples. That's what he wanted out of them. And so the reason the rabbis were so picky is when they chose a disciple, this was their goal. And they didn't want to choose just anybody. So they would choose the smartest, the most talented boys to be their disciples. And for several years, these young disciples, these Talmudim, would follow their rabbis, imitating them in every way. So what you need to understand in that day, when a little boy turned five years old and started Torah school, if he made it past the 10-year mark where he could still stay and study the rest of the Old Testament, the goal of a young Hebrew boy was not to be an NBA player or an NFL star or uh, to be the final guy on, is it the bachelor? or the, Yeah, the bachelor. You know, that, that wasn't their thing. It was, I want to be like this rabbi right here, and I'm going to sit at his feet. This is what little Hebrew, Hebrew boys did because the religious the religious leaders and rulers, they were called not just leaders, rulers of the day. That was the highest profession you could attain. And so little boys didn't want to be a soccer star. They wanted to be a rabbi. And not just any rabbi. They wanted to be a rabbi that had what was known as another real cool Greek word, shmiha. And shmiha means one with authority. And so when you look at Jesus, did Jesus have shmiha? Or at age 12, Jesus was in the temple correcting the religious rulers. Oh, he had shmiha. Hey, that's a cool word. Y'all want to learn to say that with me? Come on, on count of three, you say it. Shmi, sh, kind of S C H, Shmiha. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Shmiha. Yeah. What does that mean? It meant authority from up on high because what did the religious leaders of the day say about Jesus when he walked away from that temple? They were amazed in Matthew chapter 7, just a couple of chapters right after this. They were amazed because he taught them as one with Shmiha, authority. At age 12. Okay, so here we go. Here comes Matthew 4. Jesus knows the Torah so well. This is what he's doing. And right before Matthew chapter 4, by the way, right before Matthew chapter 4, Jesus had gone to the wilderness and met up with a guy by the name of John the what? 
John the Baptist, the little guy that ate locusts and, and wore his hair long and camel skins, and he was dripping with Shemitah if there ever was one. And why do I say that? Because Jesus said he's the goat. You know what goat means? What's goat mean in today's terms? Greatest of all times. And what did Jesus say about this John the Baptist? He said to him, of all those born to women, all those born to women, he's the greatest. Okay? If Jesus says that about you, that means you've got some authority, some shmiha dripping all over you. And yet when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming out of that woods and coming down to that, to that lake, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, and I am not even worthy to untie his sandal. So John the Baptist didn't think that about himself, but Jesus did. And so here's what I want you, there's going to be five points to today's message. Five points. And the first point is, number one, Jesus doesn't choose the best. He chooses those that are willing. He doesn't choose the best like the other rabbis did. He chose the willing. And what's that mean for you and I? Well, who did Jesus choose? While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers and they were casting a net for they were what? What was their profession? They were what? Fishermen. I want you to think about what that actually means. They were fishermen that at age five began a study of the Torah. In age 10, they could have stayed to rest, to hit the rest of the Old Testament had they been one of the best, at age 17, they would have taken a rabbi. What does that tell us about these four? They weren't the what? They weren't the best. They were the B team. Jesus chose the B team. Let that sink in for just a moment. These guys had the opportunity, had they been of that nature, mentally, physically, spiritually, all those manners and characteristics to stay and find a rabbi. They didn't make the cut. They didn't make it. So they're fishing. That's their family business. And Jesus walks by and says, Hey, follow me. Follow me. You ever remember your old PE days? They'll ever get to choose teams on PE days. Maybe it was dodgeball, maybe it was softball, basketball, whatever it was. What was one of your greatest fears? To be chosen last. <laughs> I, I think Peter and these guys understood that concept long before they were ball playing days. Because they were not even chosen. So why would the scripture say immediately? They left. The choice you got. Here's a rabbi. It's a rabbi. He's choosing. <laughs> I'm going to go with the rabbi. And I had been chosen my whole life. And the rabbi, the teacher, just said, follow me. Gave me those words. And let me, let me tell you how John MacArthur puts this. God skipped all the wise of the day. The great scholars were in Egypt. The great library was in Alexandria. The great philosophers were in Athens. The powerful were in Rome. He passed over Herodotus, the historian, and Socrates, the great thinker, and Julius Caesar. He chose men so ordinary it was comical. That's who Jesus chose. He doesn't choose the best. He chooses the willing. Point number two. He chose us, not we, him. Jesus didn't walk by the boat and the guys look up and go, hey, can we come with you? Hey, Rabbi, can we come with you? No, Jesus chose them. And when he said, follow me, it's kind of this way. In today's world, if you're a great high school athlete, 
you might get some recruiters to come watch you play, or they might ask for some, some films, some highlight videos, so they can see if they want to offer you a scholarship or if you could make their team. And so in one respect, you're showing them what you're made of, so in hopes you might get a scholarship offer from this university that you are so desiring of going to. Peter, James, Andrew, they didn't have any clue they were being watched. They didn't have any highlight videos of them fishing. Look at all the fish I brought in last week. And yet Jesus used the same metaphor as their profession. Now you're fishing. You might be real good, but follow me and I will make you, make you fishers of men. So this is kind of a really cool thought. So what should that do to you and I? And how should we respond and react when we have this knowledge that's in God's word? And we may feel that God is calling us to do something and saying, follow me in some particular way. And you kind of go, let me pray about it. You know, there, was a, there was a term that was used that was a, uh, a really cool phrase, honestly. You were known to be a good disciple of your rabbi when people would say this about you. He's got the dust of his rabbi all over him. Now think about that for just a moment. He's got the dust of his rabbi all over him. You know, what that tells me is you and I can mess up. We, we have the ability to mess up, don't we? Yeah, we sure do. Because we're all sinners saved by the grace of God. There is none righteous, no, not even one. We mess up, and Jesus still chooses us. What's he choose us to do? Let me tell you what he, I'm so glad you asked that question. Let me tell you what he chooses you to do. What God chooses you to do is when Jesus said, I appointed you. I chose you, I appointed you, that you should, and the American Standard Bible says, would, I appointed you that you should, that you would go and bear fruit. Fruit, what does that mean? Bearing fruit means that you live your life in such a manner that you win people to Jesus Christ, and that fruit that comes out of you living your life in such a manner that you look like, act like, talk like, the dust of your rabbi is all over you, that change that happens as people are one to Jesus because of who they see in you, that's an eternal change. It's not temporary. It means that lives are changed for eternity. It's back to this thing of, am I a Christian? Do I love the Word of God? Do I think about the Word of God? Do I love church? Do I love God? Of course we love God. So many people will say that. But Jesus never called us to be a Christian. Jesus called us to be a disciple, one that goes and bears fruit, even with his last words on planet earth before departing for heaven. Go and make, make, there's that word again, make what? Christians? Make disciples. Make disciples. And you see, when you, when you use that word go, you think about that being a verb, and you think about teaching and baptize uh, and, and understanding all that I've taught to you. Those are all participles in the Greek. And what the noun is, what the concept is, what the subject is, is to make disciples. All those verbs revolve around the fact that we are supposed to go and make, make disciples. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men and women, and those that you are around. So much so, this eternal change that should come from your life and mine around other people is that Jesus said, you know, if that's not you right now, whatever you ask in my name, 
whatever you ask in my name, I'll give it to you. Do you want to be a disciple is the question. And if so, then how quickly are you ready to follow Jesus Christ? Are you scared? I, I can't follow. I mean, I don't know much about the Word. I don't know how to use God's Word to show someone who the Lord is. Have the dust of your rabbi all over you and follow Him. And God will give you whatever you ask. Lord, I really want this one person, this one person to know about you this year. I don't know where to start if you ask anything. In my name, I will give it to you. What does God want you to do? Well, what about a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Romans 6.23, one verse evangelism. One verse evangelism. Is that too difficult to learn? Knowing the difference between what death and life, what you earn, your wages, and what the free gift of God is, and knowing that we can accomplish seeing God only by the cross of Jesus Christ. One verse of Agilent for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm not asking you to study the Torah and learn it. We're not asking you to memorize the book of Hezekiah. Y'all ever read the book of Hezekiah? <laughs> oh, it's in there. It's actually called by theologians a part of two or three Old Testament books, and they actually call it the book of Hezekiah uh, as you're studying these things because of the revival that Hezekiah brought to the Israelites. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. But no, I'm not asking you even to, to, to memorize all of that. And nobody would in today's culture. But today's culture of following Jesus and becoming a disciple is no, is no different than the culture that Jesus was calling these men to. So point number three, our primary calling is to be with Him. To be with Him. That is your primary calling and my primary calling. You might say, well, wait, you're the pastor. You're supposed to be doing these things. You need to read a little bit more. My and any other pastor's primary job primary job if you're going to follow God's Word is to preach and teach this Word of God in a manner that people can understand. That's number one. And what am I supposed to do? Number two, well, I'm supposed to train the saints to do the work of the ministry. That comes through programs. That comes through providing opportunities to learn. And it comes through a study of God's Word. Because one of these Hebrew phrases that Jesus just used, the Hebrew phrase, which is what He said to Peter and John and Andrew, what He said to them was, follow Me. Now this is another one of those cool, cool words. If you try and pronounce it in the original text, it's ik fu aharai. Ik fu aharai. Aren't you glad you speak English? Yes, I am very glad we speak English. Ik fu aharai, Jesus said to them. Follow me. And that primary calling that you have and I have is to be with him. And how can we be with him in today's day and age? Is he here in the flesh as he was then? No. Is He here in the Spirit as He was? Oh, yes. And it's His Spirit that lives inside us. And how do we know our rabbi? How can the dust of our rabbi be all over us? One way and one way only. And that's the Word of God. Well, I've been in church 35 years. I studied every book of the Bible. In fact, I read every book of the Bible every year for the last 10 years. Go make 
disciples. I will make you readers of my word. No. Make disciples that look like Jesus. And how do you and I know what Jesus looks like but right here? Okay, now something very interesting just came off the computer screen day before yesterday. And I thought I'd share it with you. That's all right. Well, you're going to have to put up with it. Study of 40,000 people. Lifeway sponsored this study, our Southern Baptist organization of which we get our curriculum from. The Center of Bible Engagement compiled extensive research findings by an educational doctorate and, and another lady that had her PhD into a document titled Understanding the Bible Engagement Challenge. Scientific Evidence for the Power of Four. I want you to think about this. The power of four. And it's determined, this, this survey, this study, scientific study survey was done with 40,000 people on Bible engagement. The study indicated that when people engaged in the Scripture one time a week, and that could include a church service in which the pastor opens his word and preaches a sermon. Doesn't have to include a church service, but if people engage in one time of Bible study or scripture a week, there was negligible effect on key areas in their life. Well, Frank, I've already read all that. Are you engaging in it now? Regardless of your age. The study was done from age 8 to 80. Are you engaging it now? If you're engaging one time a week, negligible effect. The same result was true if people engaged in the Scriptures two times a week. The result equaled little to no effect on you as a person. Three times a week saw a very small indication, a spark of something that wasn't there with one and two. But still, the behavior of the person engaging in the Word of God three times a week had little to no effect on who they were. I want you to think about that. We've given you out these five by five by five. That doesn't mean you just engage in God's Word five days a week. It means you engage in a specific reading of God's Word five days a week, and the other two you get to kind of Scroll around. Oh, you don't have to. There's no requirements for that. It's just a help. If you don't have an organized Bible reading plan. But here's the kicker in this study. The eye-opener happened when Bible engagement reached four times a week. A steady climb of impact might have been expected to go from one to two to two to three to three to four. It wasn't a steady increase in impact from three to four. It was a drastic increase in impact. So much so that the stunning findings included the following. Feeling lonely dropped 30% on time number four from time number three. Anger issues dropped 32% from four to three. Bitterness in relationships drops 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. Immoral sex outside of marriage dropped 68%. Feeling spiritually stagnant dropped 60%. Viewing pornography dropped 61%. Here's the jump. In 1, 2, and 3, there was little to no dust of the rabbi on you. There was no sharing of your faith. There was no impact on other people's life. But that fourth time, sharing your faith jumped 200%. You were more willing to share about Jesus Christ with somebody else on the fourth Bible reading, and you were more likely to disciple someone, take them under your wing and say, look, Come to a Bible study with me, Larry. Come pray with me 230%. The findings hammer home the truth that there are profound differences between people who engage the Scripture 
at least four times a week and those who engage the Scripture less often. It's another study that came across the table this week that said the future of the Church of America, and it's talking about America, based on studies and findings, is not in the numbers of people that attend church, but the numbers of people that are engaged in church. Much like this study is saying, are you engaged in Scripture? Because attendance is going down. And has been for 15 years. That's not, that's not rocket science news, folks. This is the way it is in the Southern Baptist Convention in most every denomination except for one that are calling themselves nuns, N-O-N-E-S, which means I believe in God, but I'm not going to nun church. <laughs> uh-uh. Because I've seen what churches do to people. The nuns are on the rise. The only one that's called a religious movement today that is rising. There's no organization to it. There's just none. There's just none. Why? What has the pandemic done? Oh, it's gotten people very, very comfortable with staying at home in my jammies, <laughs> drinking my coffee, eating my donut, watching it on the screen. And the question that comes by an email to me at least four or five times a week from different sources is, will we get those people back? And there is no answer. I talked to a local pastor here about a week and a half ago. He said, Frank, I have no idea, zero idea who may or may not come back to church when we're back fully engaged. Because we don't know if they're gone yet. We don't know where they are because they haven't been coming because they couldn't come because of COVID. And here's what Jesus is saying to these four men. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. Take my dust upon you. And then as I leave, you will do greater works than I do. And you're going to impact more lives than I will. Because I'm going to be with my Father. But you're here on planet Earth, which we created. And you're here for a calling. You're here to do something. And you're to do it when I call you immediately. Because that's a call of God on every man, woman, and boy and girl's life is to follow Jesus. So point number four, to follow him, we have to leave it all. We have to leave it all. Immediately, they left their boat and their father. Now the boat wasn't a little skiff. It wasn't a little canoe. It didn't have a little five horse uh, mercury on it like my first boat with a little slide control for the throttle. Man, that was pretty tough in South Florida on St. Lucie River trying to land a tarpon uh, when I'm having to run the boat with two hands and hold the, hold the line like this and the tarpon jumps and they're going to shake the line and I can't even throttle down from a troll position, and so it's kind of, no, 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 their boats were 26 to 28, 30 feet long. We've already got rep representations of them that they've gotten out of the sea. We know what kind of boat. Most of them would, would uh, take about 15 different people. They had to be large boats to haul in nets because they were fishermen by trade, and they left their boat and their father immediately. That tells us two things. Number one, you're thinking, you saying i got to leave my job? No, not at all. In fact, Jesus used their job as part of what they were supposed to do. They're become fishers of men. Jesus is not asking you to leave your job. He's saying, take the dust of your rabbi to your job. He's saying, become my disciple. Sit at my feet. Engage in my word. Change the room. And how do you change the room? You know who you are. You're not just a Christian. You're a disciple. You know where you're going. Why? Because he's given you a roadmap to get there. And I know where I'm going. And how do I know where I'm going? And how can I know who I am? It's because I know whom I serve. I know whom my rabbi is. And I want is dust all over me. 
What about my family? Well, they left their father. Do you have to leave your father? Do you have to leave your mother? Do you have to leave your best relationships? Know what Jesus is saying right here. Is those relationships you value most, if you value them above your relationship with me, those are the ones you leave. We love our families. We want to love our families. But there's this little acronym called joy. It's Jesus first. Others. Second. And the things that you do. Third. Are you willing to leave those things that have more value in your life to follow Jesus? Or are you really willing to put Jesus on the sideline and say, ah, when, when, when I have some time, Lord, I need to go do a few things before I do all of that. We have to leave our most significant relationships if they are supplanting the relationship of Jesus being on the throne of our life and our heart. Most of us are not going to lose our job. Most of us are not going to leave our families. We can still ask Jesus to totally surround us with who he is. And we do that right here in his word. And if you do it four times or more a week, oh, there's change. There's change that will occur. You, you got to do it four times a week or more. That's not what I'm telling you. The scripture says daily. Daily. And what we know from our studies is if we don't, there's not going to be much change in those around us, what they see in us. So therefore, we're not changing. We're supposed to be like Christ. And the fifth, final point. He commands us to spiritually reproduce. Matthew 4.19 says, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Following Jesus means he becomes your Lord. He's not just the big guy in the sky or the coach or, or the man in charge. No, he's Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of your life. He's your Savior, but he's also your Lord, which means you will follow him at all cost. It's not your desire to be in control. It's not your desire to be in charge. It's not your desire to, I want to have it my way or the highway. No, your desire is the desire of Jesus Christ. That is what he commands us to do. And as we follow his command, John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me and what he commands us to do as disciples not as Christians but as disciples is that we prove that we are his disciples and how do we prove it John 15 8 says my father is glorified this by this that you produce much fruit and therefore prove to be my disciples you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples go baptize and teach oh those are good things but they get their good things from one controlling passage make disciples follow me and who did Jesus tell us to go into all the world and make disciples of them and the them in your life is going to be different than the them in my life. We are to go and make disciples of them. You see, you, First Baptist Holland, are God's method of church growth. You are. You just are. It's not uh, buildings that we might build. It's not budgets we might have. It's not programs. It's not ministries. It's the dust, the dust, the dust, the 
Jesus all over you. You are God's plan for church growth. There is no other. So the question we'll close with today, who is your one? You don't have a goal? You hit it every time. Who? In your mind, word association, not Super Bowl champ, not food, not pet. Who is your one? Put a name in your heart. Put a face in your heart and say, this year, Lord, if you can just have enough dust on me, that one, one draws closer to you because I am closer to you. Because I'm engaged. I'm engaged in your word. I'm engaged in the ministry of the church. I don't just come. I'm engaged in it. That's going to be the present growth of the church in today's culture. Those that are engaged. Because we don't know who's coming back. But if we can engage them besides someday on Sunday. Ooh. The gates of hell shall not prevail. And that means gates are there for defensive purposes. Hell's not coming after us. The gates are there to, to protect hell and the church of Jesus Christ. You will attack the gates and the gates will not stand because the dust of the rabbi that you're following is all over you. Father God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us your word in such a manner that we can be different. And it doesn't matter how many times we've blown it. This world that is so out to get us is only going to see that Jesus is worth following if his disciples have the dust of Jesus on them and that dust is going to be laden and laced with love of which the world will know us by. Help us, Father, to love as you did, to forgive as you did, to move forward as you have challenged us to do, to become a disciple not just someone who believes in you, who respects that. No. At any age, to be a follower, a Talmudan of Jesus Christ. We love you. It's in his name we pray. Folks, I want you to sit silently right where you are for just a moment. It's going to be a little music being played. And right here on your own, in your own time, in your own little space, I just want you to seek the face of God and see what is it, what is it about me that I can draw closer to you and thereby draw someone else closer to you as well. Choose your one. Who is it? You seek the face of the Lord right now. choose to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. I hope that is your prayer today. Just a reminder, uh, please, with all that's going on in this world with the pandemic, please take care of yourself. It's too, way too many people are getting sick and getting ill, and there's nothing we can do about it. We can't put ourselves in a bubble and a shell and protect ourselves, but there are some things that we can do, and you already know what they are. 
you're probably sick of hearing them all about washing your hands and wearing face masks and keeping social distance and all that good stuff, but we've got to try and help each other out as well during these challenging times. Thank you for your attendance here this morning. I want to remind you on the way out of a couple of things. There's a table back there. Miss Barbara is already back there. She's got several things to distribute to you. Please pick up that prayer guide, from North American Mission Board. There's also a, a journal, a prayer guide from North American Mission Board concerning who's your one. These little sheets that were in your sheet in your chairs, if you did not uh, pick up one of those, they're all over the auditorium. This just kind of gives you a little bit of help as to what that actually means. We'll follow that up a little bit next week, but because we have testimony by Thomas, we're just going to kind of bring that to a close uh, towards the end of the message uh, next week. But we're looking forward to hearing from Thomas Kennan, our prospective student minister, uh, during the service. So thank you for being here. Uh, let's close in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed and go home, all right, to our places of uh, comfort and uh, familiarity where you can still be like Jesus right there at home. Father God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being here with us this morning, Father, and thank you so much for your word. Help us to be engaged, engaged in your word. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks for being here. You are dismissed. Thanks so much for coming.